From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good morning and welcome to your statewide edition of Montana This Morning on this Wednesday, October 9th. I'm Augusta McDonald here with Miller Robson. Morning. Good morning, everybody. We are looking forward to uh, with this week still warmer than average. It's going to be warmer than average, but we are going to be cooling down. How about this? On Sunday, maybe some areas in the 50s, though, so we could be below average in some spots, possibly. Possibly. And those, those are daytime mm -hmm. highs. We have a cold front coming through that's going to come through tonight, bring those temperatures down the next couple of days, and then another cold front by the end of the weekend could bring us down even more. And we'll talk about that coming up. Temperatures across the region right now, we've got mainly 40s and 50s. Uh, our cold spot looks like Butte sitting at about 36 at the moment. Uh, again, air quality is still going to be a problem. I mentioned they're probably going to extend it out another day, and they've done that around Sheridan and northeast Wyoming. Of course, the wildfire smoke. All of us will see hazy skies today, but those are the areas where the air quality is going to be the poorest. And of course, all eyes on a powerful Category 5 hurricane known as Milton, and we'll give you the latest on that coming up. Very, very scary, dangerous situation down there in the west coast of Florida. Okay, lots to talk this morning. Thank you so much, Miller, sure. for keeping an eye on that. And like you were saying, debris left over from Hurricane Helene now poses a danger if it becomes airborne or carried into the floodwaters of Hurricane Milton. That hurricane, uh, Helene, left more than 230 people dead. A former Montana resident who now lives in Florida had her home crushed by Helene and is now bracing for Milton's landfall this afternoon. Our Charlie Kleps caught up with her. The southeastern United States continue to pick up the pieces from Hurricane Helene. They're also simultaneously bracing themselves for Hurricane Milton. It's a devastating circumstance, and for one woman who was born and raised right here in Montana, these storms are unlike anything she's ever seen. The wind was howling like 100 and 15 to 125 miles an hour pretty continuously. As the storm surge of Helene hit the banks of southern Georgia. So it's just like a lot of really scary noises happening around you. An eerie feeling swept across the region. I was terrified. I mean, being from Montana and not having to worry about things like a hurricane. For Talia Hansen, who was born and raised in Livingston, Montana, the storm was as unfamiliar as it was frightening. You don't know how it's going to impact you as an individual. You don't know how it's going to impact your friends or your neighbors. You don't know if you're going to make it out a OK or if you're going to lose everything. For Hansen, it was unfortunately the latter. This was the shape of her and her fiance's home when they returned after Helene had passed, with a tree splitting it in half. Seeing just like the demolishment of a lot of the things that you worked really hard for and you've made like life changes for is pretty heartbreaking. Their devastation felt by many with more potential damage on the way. It's going to be catastrophic around the Tampa Bay area, uh, the winds, of course, and the flooding beyond that. With Hurricane Milton ripping towards the Florida coast, longtime Georgia resident and MTN meteorologist Miller Robson says the damage could get worse. It's a rare situation for him. Uh, my heart goes out to them. Uh, a lot of prayer for those folks down there still cleaning up from Helene and probably not going to get the job done quick enough before this next one comes in. We're tired. I mean, we're all really tired of it. Things are just starting to get back to normal. And now the looming threat, the imminent danger that comes with a storm like that. The fears leaving residents like Hansen exhausted, trying to focus on what's important. It's just stuff. It's all going to be replaceable. We can figure it out. Fortunately, we are all safe, and that, that at the end of the day is what's most important. In Billings, Charlie Kleps, MTN News. Charlie, thanks so much. In political news this morning, on Monday, we took a closer look at Montana's ballot measure on abortion access. And this morning, we'll break down the other two measures you'll see on your ballot this year. MTN senior political reporter Jonathan Ambarian looks at how they could reshape the state's election system. Between them, Constitutional Initiatives 126 and 127 would make the biggest changes in decades in how Montana elects its leaders. Supporters of the measure say those changes would put the power back in the hands of voters, but not everyone is on board. Currently, Montana primary voters get multiple ballots, one for each party. They choose anyone they want and vote for only candidates in that party's primary. The top vote getter from each party moves on to the general election. If CI 126 passes, all candidates will appear on the same primary ballot with their preferred party listed. Voters choose one candidate for each office, and the top four finishers, regardless of party, will move on to the general election. 
CI-127 would change the rules for the general election. Instead of just the candidate with the most votes winning, it would require a candidate get a majority, at least 50%, to win. The legislature will have to pass a law to set up the system for what happens when no candidates get a majority. It's not special interests, it's not parties, it's about people. And this incentivizes behavior in our elected representatives that requires them to build coalitions to govern more broadly. Frank Garner, a former Republican lawmaker from Kalispell, is a board member for the group sponsoring CI-126 and 127. On Monday, he debated the measures in Helena with another former GOP legislator, Matthew Monforton of Bozeman. Monforton says under CI-126, there may be multiple candidates from a single party in the general election, and the ballot won't show which candidate is actually preferred by that party. And there will be no way for any political party, whether it's a major party or a minor party, to be able to rebut that and communicate with the voters through the ballot and say, no, this person really doesn't represent us. The only state that currently has a top four primary system is Alaska. There are top two elections in California and Washington. Paul Pope, a political science professor at MSU Billings, says every state's outcome will be different, but there is reason to think changing the primary system could have an impact. The most die-hard Republicans, the most die-hard Democrats, who tend to be out on the wings of the party, uh, they're more likely to vote in the primary than uh, what we see in the general election. And uh, if there's a little mixing of who can vote for whom, I think we're going to end up with probably less extreme uh, candidates. There are five other states where voters will be considering ballot measures to create top two, four, or five primaries this year. Idaho, South Dakota, Colorado, Nevada, and Arizona. In Helena, Jonathan Amberian, MTN News. Jonathan, thanks so much. We now know which Cowboys and Cowgirls are heading to the National Finals Rodeo in Las Vegas. Our Scott Breen shows us the notable Montana and Wyoming contestants who've made the cut. Bring on Las Vegas for the top 15 money winners in each event this regular season. One of the most dangerous men at the NFR, Miles City tie-down roper Haven Medjit. He rides in rank number two in the world and listen to the damage he does at this rodeo. Medjid won the average last year, just missed the world title by an eyelash, finishing second. He then won the average back in 2019 and did not let go of the world title, becoming a first-time champ. He's a million-dollar cowboy with over 220000 earned this season. Haven's wife Shelby won the breakaway world title last December, and she races in on top of the world again. Earning over $146,000, she has a $7,000 lead over Iowa's Josie Connor. How about this run within the last couple weeks? A sizzling time of 1.6 seconds for Shelby to win the Governor's Cup. Bareback and welcome to the party, Weston Timberman. The Columbus newcomer is seventh in your world standings with almost 154,000. Rodeo's in his blood. Weston's dad, Chris, won the Ram National Circuit Finals almost 20 years ago. And his uncle Kelly won the bareback world title exactly 20 years ago. Buffalo, Wyoming's Cole Reiner climbed off the bubble and punches his ticket at number 12. And sitting exactly on the bubble, Richmond champion rolling the dice. He is the last man in at number 15 in the saddle bronc. Wyoming's Brody Cress has climbed into the top five at number five. Our friend in Melstone, Sage Newman, makes his fourth straight NFR appearance. He's number eight with almost $190,000. And back to Wyoming for a guy who's fired up to compete in his first ever NFR. Powell's Brody Wells with a strong finish down the stretch, climbing to number 12. His career earnings prior to this year, 50 grand. This season alone, 135,000 and counting. Steer wrestling, where only one local contestant shows up and he's a world champion. Helena's Ty Erickson, 10th in the money standings. And Lisa Lockhart is back in barrel racing in the number six spot. She's won more money than any woman ever in professional rodeo, now approaching almost $4 million. Scott Breen, MTN Sports.